I had a question on my YouTube channel the other day. What's a bus? What's the difference between an analog and a digital bus? Why do we use them? Why do we need them? Are they any good? Are there any disadvantages? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Now, I'm going to do this in two parts. We're going to do the analog way first and then the digital way. So I'm going to show you on a digital audio workstation the kind of equivalent to this. Now, this is my analog mixing desk here. It's got lots of faders and control knobs and EQ and all of that sort of stuff on it. And I'm going to basically discuss what a bus is. Now, in the traditional sense, it's a vehicle weighing eight tons that carries 50 people along a road. And you can get on at various stops along the journey and then you all reach the same destination. And it's important to keep that analogy in your mind because actually it's pretty much how it works here. Now, I've got a digital audio recorder here on which are recorded seven string parts and there's a backing track as well. Now, the channels along here, I've got channels nine and ten here, which are my backing track. So I have control over the left and right outputs of the backing track, so it's a stereo track. Now, I've also got faders one to seven open here and they have string parts on seven different violin parts so if I switch all of those channels on and press play you can hear those string parts indeed I can play the string parts back by themselves by taking the backing track away Now, the most simple sort of aspect of a bus is what these channels are actually doing. All these faders are being raised to a particular level and they all feed this master fader over here on my mixer. So that is the left and right bus, the stereo bus. So any mixing desk has a bus built into it. And that's how it works. Every fader that's here raised up, I can send to the mix, which is this yellow fader here. However, and this is where a bus is useful. I could send all of those string parts, all of those seven parts there to one of these red ones here so that I've got control over the overall output of the strings. So if I do that, I'm just going to switch the mix off of these channels. And instead, I'm going to send all of the channels here to red faders one and two. So with the aid of my other camera here, I'm just going to show you that. You can see that everything on here, all of the channels on here, have, a, have the numbers 1 and 2 button down. This is not mixing desk specific, but they all work in a very similar way. And then they all come along to these two faders over here. So if I play this back now, you will hear that the violins are coming on this pair of faders only and nothing else. That's pretty useful. You want to adjust the string level overall. Instead of having to grab seven faders at once, you can just send them to a couple of these. Note that I've sent it to two faders because I've actually panned the strings a bit. In fact, quite draconian in really. Um, I've uh, sent channels one, two and three of hard left, center and right. Of course, I could just put the strings on one of these faders if I sent all of these pan controls to the middle. But I'd like to keep the strings in stereo, really. They just sound a little bit more realistic and a little bit nicer overall. There we go. So. Now, the mic that you're listening to me at, at the moment on is on this channel here. It's the only one I haven't touched so far because obviously it's feeding the master recorder and you won't hear anything if I take it down. One, two, one. One, two, there we go, we're back. Now I could send this microphone to any of these red faders, which will then allow me to record. On the mixing, on the, the um, recorder up here, 
I've got eight channels in ready to record mode. Now if I switch all of the routing buttons on here, this fader is now feeding all eight of these buses. So if I put them all up, you can see that the recorder lights light up. One, two, one, two, one, two. Also on the mixing desk over here, you can see that the eight faders, the eight uh, level meters are actually showing that there's something leaving the desk. So I'm just going to take the string lines off as well. That's the trouble. The only trouble with a mixer is you've got lots and lots and lots of buttons and you've got to be really on top of things because if you accidentally record something uh, that's feeding itself, for example, if I recorded this mic and one of those string parts was still fe feeding one of these faders, you're in trouble because you can't separate them afterwards. So if I take away um, all of all but one, you can see that only level one appears on my mix on my uh, recorder. Level two, uh, level eight, for example. Now, if I have all of them back up, like so, if I use the pan control, if I turn it all the way to the left, it will only feed the odd numbers. One, two, three, what, one, three, five, and seven. And all two, four, six, and eight, if I turn the pan control the other way. And then in the middle, it will feed them equally. So there is a little bit of a demonstration of how a bus works. Now, there is another very important bus, and that is the effects bus. Connected to the mixing desk here, I have some old outboard equipment here. And each of these violin channels at the moment is feeding one of my bits of kit, which comes back to this fader here. So if I play back the violins now, So I sent all of those violin parts to a reverb that's up in my rack over here. I could do the same thing with the backing track. I could feed the backing track to my reverb as well. That's fairly dreadful, but you can make it so that you can feed any parts of your channels up what are called auxiliaries. And that's a kind of a bus itself. You're sending all of these things to one line, which is feeding your reverb unit, which then comes back into here. So now I'm going to discuss the digital way. On the mixing desk and the analog way, we had lots of buttons and faders and switches and all of that sort of stuff. And of course, they bring their own set of problems when they get dirty, you have to sort of spray some stuff in them to clean them up or compressed air. That's the best way to do it. Now we've got the computer here and I'm going to show you the digital bus, uh, the, the sort of equivalent, if you will. Now on the screen at the moment, you can see that I've got my violin parts there and I've got my backing track. So it's exactly the same recording that I made on my digital machine. I linked the machines together via MIDI timecode, so I was recording to both at the same time. So I've got my violin parts there and I've got my backing track. Now, if I open the mixing desk on the computer up, you can see that there is a set of faders, some, some of them set quite low. Now, actually, these are the violins. If you record lots of the same thing, you are going to get quite a lot of level overall. Now, while it's not necessarily a problem if the faders are low, they become less sensitive, um, or rather, they become less accurate. They can become more sensitive, actually, so that a tiny change in level is actually quite a lot of change in sound. But we can do something about this. Now, if I just raise my um, faders up here, so I'll just ra raise the faders to a controllable level, but I'm going to send them all instead to a bus. Let's try bus three. Now a new bus appears on my mixing desk here, which is my violin bus. Um, I'm going to name it violins as well, just so that I can keep track of everything. It's really, really important that you keep track of stuff. I'm going to bring that fader down and see what happens uh, with the mix. Now, 
in order to bring this fader, in order to have this at zero, which would be nice, I can actually insert a gain stage into the overall thing and just take the gain right down. So it just makes it more manageable and you've got a fader that you can control easily and make very, very small adjustments as required. Now, as you can see with the pan controls, just like on the analog desk, I've got left and right. I've panned stuff hard left and hard right. If you're recording parts, you've got to be really accurate with your timing in order that that is, you know, it doesn't stick out with your panning. Um, so I will actually bring them in ever so slightly. It's a bit more realistic, really, if you have, have stuff in the sort of not right at the edges. Now, I've got three of the same part here, then three of another part here and then a lower part there. I've just got one single channel of that. Now, that's the bus that I've got here. Now, there's other ways of doing this. If I say, OK, well, I'm going to return these to the main output. Now, beware, because it will be loud. So you've got to take your faders down so it doesn't blast your ears. You could put a gain stage on every channel in order to lower that, or you could just record a bit lower in level. That might be a, a better bet. You can, in fact, change the gain of the actual audio file as well. You can go back into the uh, back into these and actually make them lower so that your faders come up. Beware. I mean, the noise problem isn't really there with digital systems anymore, unless you really get it wrong and you hear all this sort of quantization noise and think, what's happening? So go back into my mixer and this time I'm going to send if I, now this is if for reverbs, really, I'm going to send all of these channels to a reverb. Now, why would I do that? Why can't I just put a reverb on each channel? You know, it's a computer, it can do anything. Well, yeah, but if you use a convolu convolution reverb, like the Space Designer or some, something else that's really RAM hungry, it's going to make the computer crash. So instead, I'm going to use a bus. Uh, oh, prison main floor. Hmm, I wonder what that sounds like. So this is basically the equivalent of the aux controls on the analog mixing desk. So if I raise these faders now, I've got a nice reverb that's been sent from the channel. Now, unlike the mixing desk here, but you can get it on some mixers, you can elect to have the signal that goes to the reverb after the fader or before it. Now, the problem with pre-fader is if I wanted to get rid of that reverb, if I wanted to lower the, the level overall of the violins, because it's pre-fade, it would leave the reverb intact. So you don't have any control over the effects. Usually effect sends will be post-fader, which is where I would have it. Pre-fader is for a few for example, if you were setting up a mix for um, a recording artist, but you wanted to have separate control over your mix in the studio itself, that's the kind of thing that you would do. So I've got my bus set to prison floor. Yeah, I can hear the convicts. So I've got all of those. I could elect even to take the bus control off there, just take them away or indeed switch them off. Uh, no send and actually use my violin fader to feed the reverb. That might be a better way of doing it, for example, less processing involved. So if I just, um, for example, um, set my bus to prison main floor, I'm just going to uh, select this to my output bus, which is violins, there we go. So at the moment you heard the violins, now you won't, unless you bring the fader up. Of course, I've got my gain stage there. I'm just going to uh, raise the overall. These faders still have an effect on your bus, but you won't hear them sort of directly as it were. It's only from this fader here. And then I can send that single bus to the, uh, the prison floor. 
Now, as with lots of reverbs that you have in your rack, you could set up lots of different ones on virtual channels on your computer. Now, of course, this is not door specific. This is Logic Pro X, but the same goes for Cubase or Ableton or any of the other ones, even GarageBand for iOS, which has auxes for master reverb and master echo. So that's quite a neat little thing there. You don't have to put reverb on each channel. You have a little control at the bottom, which actually feeds a master reverb control, which you can then adjust. So GarageBand for iOS, a lot has been done with that. It's really, really thoughtful. So you can also, I could send all of these to different outputs of my audio interface. You can see that I've got a lot of output channels here. I've got the Focusrite Sapphire Pro 56. So I could send them to different outputs for mixing down in the old analog way if I so, so wished. So I can do a sort of a bit of a mix and match with analog and digital. So there we are, there's a little comparison and I hope that busing is more clear to you.